Come on, are you ready for the Word of God today? I am not Pastor Jason, okay? All right, I just need to clear that up for some of you guys. I'm Pastor Brennan, but I've had the privilege of walking here at Discovery with Pastor Jason and Veronica since day one. I like to say that, you know? The youngsters call, they, they say that makes you OG. So apparently I'm OG. I don't know what that stands for. No, I'm just kidding. I know what that stands for. Where are my dads at today? Happy Father's Day. You know, dads, we can say a lot to our kids, but our actions speak louder than our words. You're here in the house of God, man. That's powerful. Thank you. I want to do something. I got a gift card and a book to give away to a dad here today. First service, I gave it to the dad who'd been the dad the longest. But I want to mix it up. If you just had a baby and you've only been a dad for like a week or a month or two months or three months, raise your hand, or four months, there's got five months, six months, a dad, the youngest dad, maybe, maybe 11 months, 12 months, okay, 11 months, 10 months, all right, who else? Anything younger than 10 months? No, that's it. Hey, happy Father's Day. Come grab this. He'll give that to you, a gift card. Go have a good time, man. Bless you. There's something amazing about being a father, and we're going to read about that in the passage today. Paul has a lot to say about fathers. He has a lot to say about that in the Word. It just so happens to line up, but I'm ready. I'm hungry, and I want to give you the Word of God. I hope you're ready. I hope you came today hungry, saying, God, speak to me. And so if you're here in the house or you're watching online or in the courtyard, man, make that your declaration. God, here I am. Speak to me because I want to learn and I want to grow. Amen? How many of you want to grow today? Come on. That's what I like to hear. You better buckle up because we're continuing on in our series on Ephesians. It's part four. We got two chapters we're going to work through. But in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul begins to give us this rich theology in deep doctrine. And so he spends time unpacking theology and doctrine. And in the last three chapters of Ephesians, Paul turns the corner from theology to practical. So Paul's going to show us today, how do we practically live out our life as a follower of Christ? And the good news is, is Paul has a lot to say to us today about how to do that. So I'm excited to jump into it. Come on, would you read with me? Maybe you brought your Bibles. Ephesians 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Paul's saying, listen, therefore, based off everything I've said to you thus far, I want you to, and I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've received. There's this implication in this statement that you've received something. And the truth is, if you're in Christ, you have received something. And the implication is this, that what God did for you and I through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, that it was so great, it was such a gift, it was such grace, such mercy, such love, that you and I, in light of that, in light of what Jesus has done, should live worthy of the calling we should value God's love, God's gift to us so much that we allow God to shape us. And this isn't a calling into professional ministry. I know some of you are like, well, thank God I wasn't called. No, this is God's call over all of us, all of us. And this is what Paul's saying. He's not saying, okay, if you obey God, then you'll be blessed. No, that was Old Testament. He's saying, God already blessed you. God already died for you. So in light of that, in response to that, let's live differently. And I don't know about you, but I'm trying to live differently than the world, amen? I'm trying to let God do a new work inside of me. And Paul, he uses this word walk a lot all through all of his letters, but especially in Ephesians. You're gonna read Paul talking about walking. And the reason he does that is because our, our relationship with God is like a walk in a lot of ways. And Paul is instructing us to walk. It's an invitation. Paul says walk. In Romans 8, he says it's a walk with God. In Galatians 5, Paul, he encourages us to walk in the Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says walk by faith. In 3 John, he says we walk in the truth. 1 John 2 says we walk as Christ walks. This is a walk we're on. He's instructing us to walk. But really, it's an invitation to walk. Paul's inviting you. He's inviting me on a walk 
with God. And the imagery that we get when we consider our relationship with God as a walk is that we're going somewhere, that there's a destination we're going to. I don't know about you, but I hate slow walkers. Listen, when I went on my first date with my wife, I was like, are we gonna walk? Because I need to know, is she a quick walker or a slow walker? <laughs> slow walkers stay together, all right? Fast walkers stay together. If you married a slow walker, we're praying for you, okay? You're gonna be all right. But man, we're walking, it's a journey. We have a destination. Christ has a destination and a plan for your life that's greater than where you're at. Man, that this world, the enemy wants to use everything in the world to destroy you, but God wants to take you on a walk of fulfillment and freedom. Paul wants to show us that walk today. So he goes on to say this. Hey, I urge you to, be, um, to live a manner worthy of the calling. He said, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Because there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Paul's saying right now, right off the bat, if you wanna live a life worthy of your calling that you've received, you need to eagerly pursue unity. Simple. He's laying out the foundation of our walk with God, and it, it's marked by unity, which is interesting, right? Because he says to make every effort to walk in unity. And it's interesting because Unity is so difficult. Right now, our culture is marked by division. Everybody wants to be divided about something. No one wants to walk in unity. Unity is difficult. But Paul's saying we're not united because we're a part of the same religion. We're united because we share in the truth that we're all forgiven, accepted, redeemed, bought with a price. We pursue unity because Christ forgave us. And it's not easy. It's not this easy thing that he invites us into. Unity is the key to Christ's likeness. You can't say, I'm walking with Jesus and not walk in unity. You can't serve God and not walk in unity. And here's the reason why. Because as followers of Christ, if we cannot be united, if us in this room cannot be united, what hope is there for the world that does not know Christ? The greatest indicator that you're a follower of Christ, is that you have the ability to walk in unity. And Paul's saying, we need to do that. That's the foundation. So the question is, how do we live in unity? If Paul's saying to us, this foundation is unity, how do we walk in that? How do we do that? And is it really possible to have unity with everyone? Because I got some crazy people in my life, you know what I'm saying? And some of them are family members. Amen, wow, okay. And the answer is yes, it's possible. While the world, the, the world is trying to unite around ever-changing ideals, and, but we're united around the eternal, never-changing God. He doesn't change. We're united around a God who never changes, who's the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We're not trying to unite around the new fad, the new thing. We're united around Jesus. And this unity is only possible as we choose to walk in humility that's supported by gentleness and patience. The Bible says in that passage of scripture that we are to bear with one another in love. And that's like a really archaic saying, to bear with one another in love. Thou shalt bear with one another in love. You, you know, say that to your wife when she's mad at you. It works. No, it doesn't work at all. It makes her more mad, you know? Don't do it. What would even make it worse if you were like, you need to, baby, you need to read this. All right, don't do that. But really, this is what it better translates to, putting up with each other in love. You see, Paul understood the only way we would walk in unity is if we were walking in humility, gentleness, and if we had the capacity to put up with one another. Because I can't change your actions. Some of y'all are crazy. And God's calling me, he's calling you to put up with one another. And this, this is made possible only as we walk in humility. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Walking in unity has little to do with actually agreeing with someone and it has everything to do with bearing with one another in love. And Paul, he, he gives us and makes this incredible focus on one another. And this focus on one another is significant. The word occurs 40 times in 
all of Paul's writings and letters, Christians are a part of each other. The Bible says that we are one body. In the verse we just read earlier, it says we're one body, one Christ, one Lord. So we're all part of one body, and we are to receive one another. We are to think about one another, serve one another, love one another, build up one another, not tear down, bear each other's burdens, submit to each other, and encourage each other. We need to make every effort to maintain unity. In a day and age where division is so rampant, and if you think this word is not applicable to you, wait until November comes around and everybody starts talking about politics. Then it's really gonna be hard to be unified, but here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make every effort to walk in unity, motivated by love, amen? Amen, come on. The good news is this, because some people are hard. Paul gives us some hope in verse seven. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Did you know that God has given you a grace to walk in unity? I need that grace sometimes because we're around some difficult people, but he's given me the grace to walk in unity with one another. And thank God for grace, a grace to maintain unity because without it, we'd be in trouble. Somebody say, I need grace. Amen, you do. See, you said it, not me. So Paul's showing us that our walk with God has its foundation in unity and is others focused. It's not a, a walk with God where I'm saying, hey God, me, me, me. My walk with God is gonna cause me to put my focus on one another, on others, which is in stark contrast to the world in which they were living in, in which we are living in. And we get a sense of what the culture looked like when Paul was addressing the church in Ephesus when we look at verse 17. So look at verse 17 with me. Paul says, with the, the Lord's authority, which is an interesting statement, because Paul's actually saying, this is from God, okay? So church, not from my authority, but from the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer. Other translations say no longer walk as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. You guys, we live in a culture that's hopelessly confused. We live in a culture that doesn't even know their own identity, that argues about identity, that tries to push their viewpoint on you. They celebrate the very thing that we're trying to walk out of. And then here's the deal. If you don't agree with it, you're in the wrong. And you know what Paul says? Eagerly pursue unity, but don't walk the way they walk. He didn't say, don't, don't say the right things. He said, no, I want your actions to look a certain way in the midst of a culture that's crazy. He says this, their minds are full of darkness. They wander. This is that walking analogy again. When they're far from God, they're just wandering. They don't know where they're going. There's no destination. They wander far from the life God gives. Why? Because their minds are full of darkness. They've closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. In this passage, Paul's referencing the state of Ephesus, but it's really the state of the world we live in today. There's a pattern that we see time and time again when people move away from the things of God and move into the world. And here's what we see. At first, it starts when we're just exposed to darkness. We get exposed to things. You're not dark, but you're around dark things. But then those things begin to take up residence in your mind. And this is a darkened mind that the verse talks about. You begin to develop a darkened mind just because you were exposed to it. You might not even agree with it, but you hung around with it. And then your mind became dark. But before long, what started as just exposure, you need to catch this, begins to permeate in our hearts. You start thinking differently. You start desiring differently. You've been so exposed, so inundated that your heart has actually changed and your heart becomes darkened. And when you have a darkened mind and a darkened heart, you will reap darkened behavior. And this is where we lose our shame. We give in to every desire and lust. Darkened minds plus darkened hearts equal darkened behaviors. 
Sin has a narcotic effect on persons and cultures. It feels good for a while, but then it begins to break us down and deaden everything inside of us that's good. What is right and what is true. And Paul's saying, now that you know you're a follower of Christ, there's something you need to know and you need to remember. That used to be what you were like. But you don't walk like that anymore. You don't walk in that anymore. You don't act like that. You don't do those things. That's not who you are. It is who you were, not who you are. Some of you, God's done a work inside of you, but you're still walking as you were. But God wants you to walk as you are in him. That's the model. It's a guide for your living now. And Paul, he gives us the solution because if it's not how we're supposed to live, then how am I supposed to walk? What am I supposed to do? What does walking well look like? We know what, what walking wrongly looks like, but what does it look like to walk well? And he lays it out so simply in Ephesians 5. He says, we need to be imitators of God. In a dark world, we need to be imitators of God. Uh, chapter 5, 1 says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Why? Because you are his dear children. I love this analogy Paul uses where he says, hey, listen, don't, it's so easy to look like the world when you're around the world, but if you spend more time with Jesus, you're gonna look like him. So imitate God just like dear children. And anyone who spends enough time around kids understands that they're little imitators. They're copycats. They literally will watch you and do and say exactly what you do. It's amazing and absolutely terrifying. And what I love is when we get around other people's kids and you see them say something or do something and the parents are like, I don't know where they learned that. We're like, dude, you do that. Like you say that, you know, that kids are natural imitators. It's who they are. And get this, just like your children will imitate you, dad, we as children of God should imitate our heavenly father. And some of you, you had a horrible example of a father growing up, but guess what? You have a heavenly father who was the greatest example for you. You've got a father who's an example, and guess what? What you are around is what you will walk like. It's interesting, imitation. Paul could have said, hey, talk like a Christian, but he didn't. He said, imitate God. He could have said, hey, look like a Christian, but he didn't. He said, imitate God. Talk is cheap, but your actions are powerful. Pastor Veronica, she, she spoke a few months ago and she talked about the anointing. She talked about the power of the anointing of God. And you might not remember what she said, but you'll never forget what she did because she literally got on stage and poured like a gallon of oil and anointed someone. What you don't know is everybody she brought up on stage had a call of God on your life. Did you know they might not remember what she said, but they'll never forget what she did. You will not be remembered by your words. You will re be remembered by your actions. Who are you imitating? Who are you imitating? And I got a question for you today. If people imitated your relationship with Christ, what kind of relationship would they have? Because I'm concerned that some of us, we're trying, but we're doing a really bad impression of Christ. And Paul, he's got something to say about this. Because the enemy, his goal is to get you looking more like the world and less like Christ. And so he wants to show us how to live. The enemy, he wants a grip on you. And he's gonna do it by trying to get your mind. He wants a grip on you. Paul says, listen, there's a few things we need to do. And we need to ask ourselves a few questions. How do, we, how do we stay out of the enemy's grasp? How do I combat the enemy's schemes? How do I stay in my right position? How do I keep from drifting back to this old way of living? How do I make sure I'm not imitating the wrong people? You need to ask yourself these questions first. Who am I walking with? Who are you walking with? Because who you walk with will determine your destiny. And I'm not saying don't love your neighbor, don't minister to someone in need. I'm talking about walking doing life with someone. If you aren't careful, your heart will harden if you're around the wrong people. Ephesians 4, 17, he says, now 
This I say to you and testify in the Lord, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Who are you walking with? Who are you walking with? We have to surround ourselves with the right people, the right community, if we wanna walk in the fullness of Christ. This is why you need to be in a small group here at Discovery. Some of you, you're like, I, if I only had Christian friends, then I wouldn't like, I would do better. Okay, great. There's a whole church here that wants to be your friend and they're not crazy, okay? Some, okay, some are in a church that with this many people in the room, but they're, they're probably as crazy as you, you know? But this is small group season. This is the key to life change is being around the right people. Some of you, you need to reassess who you've been around and you need to get around the right people. The next question we need to ask ourselves to make sure we aren't drifting back to an old life is this, where have I lost my sensitivity? Where, where have I lost my sensitivity? And really what we're saying here is what things used to bother you, what dark things used to bother you, but they don't bother you anymore. Because Satan wants you to be desensitized to wickedness, to evil. Because if you lose your sensitivity, you'll begin to embrace that. What you allow in your home will begin to permeate in your life. Some of you, you're allowing certain things to be watched on TV and you know it's wrong and you've kind of lost your sensitivity to it, but it's actually having this profound influence on you and even more on your family. So as men, we need to say, you know what, man? It starts with me. I'm not gonna be desensitized to this. I, God, would you renew in me a sensitivity to, to the things of you? Ephesians 4.19 says, they have become callous. And if you don't know what a callous is, a callous is when you, you, do, you work something. I have calluses on my fingers from playing guitar. When you first start playing guitar, it hurts so bad. You're like, why am I doing this? I wanna give up. And then you do it enough and you get calluses and, and my fingers, they're like hard on the tips. And I can touch hot things and it doesn't burn. So I'm always like, that's hot, grab it. And I'm like, whatever, you know, it doesn't burn me because I have a callus there. I've lost my sensitivity because I've overexposed my nerve endings to something, to pain for so long that I don't feel the pain anymore. They didn't feel pain anymore. The culture, they became calloused. A callus takes time to develop, but once it's there, you don't feel pain. When we don't feel pain, we get hurt and we hurt other people and we don't even realize it. We begin doing the things that hurt ourselves and others. Because what you're consuming now that used to bother you is actually hurting you. And the enemy wants us to continue to walk in our old selves, in our old mindset, our old habits, because he wants to keep us slaves. So we need to walk in, a, in our new mind, in a new way, imitating Christ. But what does imitating Christ look like? And that's the question that we have to wrestle with. If, if Paul's saying, Listen, you need to walk in unity. You need to imitate Christ. We need to know, Paul, what does that look like? And he has, um, gives us the frame for how we are to walk our new life out. And it's found in verse 21. He says, since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, here's what you're to do. Throw off your old sinful nature, your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Paul's saying there's some things on you that used to mark your life, your old way of life, and you can't leave them on anymore. And he uses this image of clothing, that you're going to take it off, that you have the ability to take some things off and put some things on that will mark you so that you can be an imitator of Christ. And we need to take a few things off if we're gonna look more like Christ. The first thing we need to take off is, I need to take off my old habits and patterns. And I've got some old habits, I've got some things that are kind of ingrained in me, and it, it doesn't actually imitate Jesus. It imitates how I was raised and how I used to be, but it's not, it doesn't line up with how God's calling me to walk. And some of us, if we were honest, we would say, man, that's me, I, I have some, some old habits, some old patterns, and, and you know what it is. And if you don't know, ask one of your friends, ask your dad, your mom, or your spouse. I say ask your spouse last because she'll give you something, okay? So, and I want you to have heard it from a few other people before she tells you, all right? But Paul's saying, throw off your old sinful nature, your former way of life. I love 1 Timothy because it's, it's difficult for me to change who I am, especially because I've lived this way for a while. 
But he gives us this image. He says, don't waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, you need to train your body to be godly. This is me training to say, God, I wanna, I wanna bear your image well. I'm gonna train my body to be godly. Physical training is good, and y'all, we need to do more of that, you know what I'm saying? But training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come, amen? Paul then, he goes on to summarize a list of things that we should be taking off. He says we should stop lying. He said we shouldn't be angry anymore. We should quit stealing we should no longer be marked by corrupt speech and bitterness. And I love this part, because if you're in the room, you might be saying, okay, Brennan, this is where you're gonna tell me all the things I shouldn't do anymore, and why I'm not a good Christian, yada, yada, yada. And I totally understand that. I get that. Because for years, Christians in the church have been going to non-Christians and telling them that if they don't act a certain way, they're gonna go to hell. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not about sin management. Paul's not saying, hey, this is all about sin management. It doesn't say we take these things off so that he will forgive us. It says we take these things off because he's forgiven us. Man, God, because you've given me this great gift, I'm taking this off. It's not who I am anymore. It doesn't line up with the fact that you've been bought with the price. You're not bought with the price and then live in the world. You go, no, I'm taking this off. Do it because he's forgiven us. It's our job as followers of Christ to love well, and then God will lead people to repentance. We don't need to step in and tell people how to live their life. We need to tell them to get close to Jesus, and then he'll do it. I'll never forget, I had a buddy of mine. I met him years ago. Good friend, he was in my wedding. Me and my wife just celebrated our nine-year anniversary. She makes me watch the wedding video over. It's like 40 minutes. I love her, so I do it. And she cries, and I do get a little emotional, you know. Um, but I saw my friend who was in my wedding, but before that, years before that, when I first met him, we were at church in a parking lot, and I saw a guy walk up to a 2007 Ford Ranger, and he was breaking into the truck. He had the antenna, he had taken off the truck, and he was like trying to get in, and I'm like, hey, what you doing, buddy? And he's like, um, getting in my truck? And I was like, oh, it's your truck. And he's like, yeah, it's my truck. And I said, why don't you have your keys? He's like, I don't, I'd leave my keys in there. You can unlock every Ford Ranger with the antenna. Let me show you. So by the way, if you need to know how to get into a Ford Ranger, I'm your guy, okay? <laughs> I'll help you out. We're not gonna steal it, we'll joyride it, okay? I'm just kidding, we won't do that. But anyways, I'll never forget because I said, well, what are you doing here? He said, man, this is my first time coming to church in a long time. Last night I woke up at the foot of my toilet and I knew I needed Jesus, and I don't even know what it looks like, so I came to church. I live right down the street. He began to tell me about his life. He began to tell me about his drug abuse, his, how he, every single night he was with a different girl, a different person, and um, I said, man, can we grab coffee? And so we connected, and, and as he's sharing more about his story, you know, inwardly what I wanted to do was tell him how to live. I wanted to tell him, like, hey, man, you gotta quit doing that. That's bad for you. You need to stop doing that, but the Lord quickened my heart in a moment and said, do not tell him how to live. Tell him to seek me. And I, I, I literally, I'll never forget it. And here's why. You might convince somebody to do something that only lasts a moment. But if God gets a hold of somebody's life, it's eternal. If God grabs somebody and says, come on, you're a new creation. It lasts forever, longer than a week. I can get anybody to do anything for a day, okay? Because I'm a good like, communicator. I can convince you. But God will get you to change your life. And you know what he did? It didn't take 24 hours. He picks the phone up and he calls me. He goes, Brandon, I was reading the word. And I picked up my phone. I called every single person I knew that I used to use drugs with. Every girl that was going to come over, I said, don't come over. I'm leaving this life behind. I'm a Christian now. Everything I would have told him to do, God led him to do. I'm telling you, this isn't about me. This isn't Paul trying to tell you what to do and not to do. It's about you responding to the grace of God in your life, to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. 
Come on, how many of you want to walk with God today? I need to point one more thing out before we get into how we are to walk. Paul, he talks about taking off. And I think for us, since we understand taking off is not a law. A law is something that defines you. A law says, if you don't do this, you get in trouble. Paul wasn't saying this was the law. Paul was saying, this is a right you have. A right is a freedom. It's something you have the ability to do whenever you want. I need you to understand that you have actually been given the authority, a spiritual birthright to not live the way you used to live. Some of you, you think you're slaved to old patterns and old mindsets. You are not. God has given you a superpower, so to speak, to take off things that used to mark you, to take off insecurity, to take off greed, to take off anger. It's not a law. It's a right that you have. God has given you the power. So we need to take some things off and put some things on. So now that you see that this isn't just about a list of things to not do and to do, rather that you have a supernatural power to take things off, remove generational curses, Paul then gives us a list of a few things we should take off. And I believe since Paul wrote it down, we should probably read it, right? It's not exhaustive, but it's five things I want to talk about today. The first thing we need to do, if we want to be more like Jesus, is replace lying with truth-telling. Replace lying with truth-telling. Now listen, I get it. Some of you, you're not outright liars. And some of you are outright liars, habitually. It's true. Some of you, you lie and you know it, and you know it's wrong. And Paul's saying, listen, you need to stop that. You need to take that off, and I need you to start telling the truth. You actually need to be a truth-teller, not a liar. Some of you, you think you're fine, but you actually are deceitful more than you think. You tell people what they want to hear and not the truth. You think you're helping them, but you're actually hurting them. Paul says, therefore, each one of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Why? Because we're all members of one body. You have the ability to speak life into people, but you will not help people by lying to them. You will build them up by telling them the truth. Whenever we tell the truth, the spirit of God works because God is truth. But whenever we tell a lie, Satan goes to work because he's the liar. Lying hurts the body, disrupts unity by creating conflicts and destroying trust. It tears down relationships. But truthfulness opens the door to understanding. And if God is truth and we're to model him, then we need to make every effort to walk honesty, even when it hurts others, because Christ is truth. Amen? I can promise you this. Deceit is more destructive than honesty. The second thing Paul's asking us to take off, he's saying, I need you to replace unrighteous anger with righteous anger. Ephesians 4.26, this is what he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anger will make you do and say things you would never, ever say otherwise. Left unchecked, it has the destructive power of a tornado. Not only that, it hurts you and it hurts other people. Paul's not saying you can't be angry. And I'm so thankful for that as a father because there are some things that when they happen, I get angry and I have a right to be anger. Paul is saying I want you to walk in righteous anger, not unrighteous anger. The main difference here that you need to know is that unrighteous anger, listen to this, it tears someone down. Righteous anger builds someone up. So anytime you're angry and you desire to hurt someone, that's unrighteous anger. In your anger, we manage that and we learn to walk in righteous anger that desires to build the other up. And the other truth is, Another reason we shouldn't be angry is, have you ever tried to go to sleep angry? Let me rephrase it. It's impossible to go to sleep when you're angry. It's impossible. But here's the key. When you're in bed, get out of bed and pray and go, God, I'm giving this to you. 
man, sometimes I got to do that. Sometimes I'm laying in bed and I cannot sleep. And then finally I'm like, all right, I'm getting out of bed and I go out in the living room and I sit down and I go, God, this is not outside of your control. I'm surrendering this to you and I'm going to bed. And you know what? I fall asleep like a baby because God's got it. He says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, amen? So for that person you're angry with, God's gonna get them, all right? Amen, come on. But we need to learn to manage our anger and learn how to handle righteous anger because unresolved anger always leads to bitterness and resentment. And the truth is, is you'll never fix your marriage being angry. You'll never do it. You'll, you'll never fix your child being angry. You'll never solve that problem in anger. You'll never succeed in your company angry. And nobody wants to be around angry people. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So every day that he takes is a day he wins. And every day that you wake up angry and fester in it is a day you'll never get back, a day that's been stolen from you. And some of you are like, well, I'm just mad right now. I'm just upset right now. I'm going to be upset too because that's what I do. No, 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 no. You just got robbed right now. You just got robbed. Talk about generational curses. Some of you say, I got my mama's temper. Watch out. You don't need your mama's temper. You need God's character. That's what you need. Proverbs 15, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. The next thing you need to do is replace stealing with working and giving. Paul said, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need, stealing was so common in the first century. And stealing is so opposite of the character of God. Do you want to know why stealing is so opposite the character of God? Because he gave his life. He could have came and took your life, but he gave his life. God is a giver, others focused. So when you steal, you aren't modeling the life of Christ. Paul's saying, man, we need to work. If God gave his very best, the absence of work is your ability to not give. You know when you meet people who they never work and they don't have a job and they're, they're literally depressed? It's because there's something that happens when I have the ability to give. And I, man, the more money I make, the more I can give. The more God gives me, the more I can give. But you don't have the ability to give when you have nothing to give. Likewise, when you steal and you rob, and sometimes you're like, well, I don't steal. Like some of you do, like you're a kleptomaniac, that's what they call it. I saw it on Dateline NBC, no, I'm just kidding. Some of you, you don't, but you know where you do steal is on your expense report. You steal from your work. Man, God doesn't want you to do that. That's not his character. His character is not theft, it's giving. We need to replace corrupt talk with edifying talk. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The word unwholesome actually means rotten. It, it, it translates to rotten fish, rotten meat. And do you know what happens when you consume something that's rotten, something that's unwholesome? You literally get sick. You know when you're around someone who all they do is spew just negativity, you literally feel what? You feel sick. And I've been around those people and I'm like, dude, I, I, I don't wanna be around you. And they'll be like, why don't you wanna be my friend? And I'm like, dude, you are, you're unhealthy. I'm gonna be honest in love. You're an unhealthy person and you're not happy and you need to seek the Lord. But we cannot allow unwholesome talk to come out of our mouth. Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So if you want to take off on a wholesome talk, you actually have to address your heart first. Pastor Jason had an incredible message on this last week. You should listen to it. He really talks about the language we use. So we need to replace corrupt talk with edifying talk. And lastly, we need to replace bitterness and rage with kindness and forgiveness. Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. Bitterness is, anger, is different than anger because bitterness is settled hostility that poisons your entire being. 
Anger is a reaction. Bitterness is something I've chosen to walk in. And bitterness desires to break someone down. So Paul's saying, man, don't do that. You need to be made renewed in that. And he takes time to list out these five things we need to replace. But truthfully, Paul's talking about these outer things that mark us. But then he says that we need to take something else off if we're going to really walk in wholeness. He says you need to take off your old way of thinking. You need to take off your old way of thinking. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. And this is how God transforms you. He transforms you by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And if we're going to do that, we need to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. If we need to change the way we think, we need the Holy Spirit to renew our minds. He says, throw off your old sinful nature. And he says, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. And the way we do this is in John 17, 17. God, how do I renew my mind? Jesus, he prayed for his disciples in the garden before he was crucified. He said, sanctify them by the truth. What's the truth? The word of God is the truth. He said, sanctify them by this, by the word of God. And that's how you're gonna renew your mind. And so if we're gonna renew our mind, we need to do that. And I don't know about you, but I wanna change life. I want God to renew me. I don't wanna walk in my old nature. The last thing we need to do is you need to take off the labels that defined you. And I really felt the Lord speak this to me. Some of you, you're wearing a label that you need to take off. And the label is something that someone put on you. Maybe you put it on yourself. Maybe you walked a certain way for so long that you started to allow that to define you. And you wear it like a label. I'm an addict. I'm a liar, I'm angry, I'm depressed, I'm broken, I'm lost. Paul's saying you can take that off. You can take that off. These labels have actually begun to identify you, your character, your, your nature. And labels can sometimes be the hardest things to remove. And Paul's saying today, take it off. I don't know what's been spoken over you. And I don't know the label that you're wearing today. But we as a church, we speak over you. It's not who you are. So every label, we take every label, we take it off and we take it to the cross. Every label that somebody put on your life, every label we bring it to the cross. We find freedom and forgiveness at the cross. You are not what has been said about you. You are not what's been spoken about you. Receive it today. Receive the word of God. We bring everything to the cross, our struggles, our addictions, our battles, all the labels, maybe that you even earned, maybe a label you earned or one that's been put on you. But however they came to you, we lay it down at the foot of the cross. I can take it off and I can lay it down and give it to God. I'm not wearing it anymore. And this is what we do. I'm taking it off and I'm putting on Christ likeness. God, this isn't who I am. I'm a son of God. You're a daughter of Christ. That's what you're wearing now. We're taking the labels off. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Paul said, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed, and behold, all things have become new. You can walk as a new creation today, and God wants to walk with you. It's a journey. There's a lot of things God can do in a moment. And there are some things God has the patience to do in you over years. And he wants to walk with you. And I hope that you want to walk with God today.